Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Warrior's Corner. Presenting U.S. Army Special Operations Command, the Soft, Cyber, the soft Space Cyber Triad, enhancing large-scale combat operations now and in the future. All right, well, good morning. I'm Lieutenant General Dan Carbler. I am the commander for U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, and I also am in the commander, the commander of Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense. In that capacity, I work for General Jim Dickinson as the Spacecom Commander. So let me just give you, let me set the stage a little bit here from where I'm going to come from before, uh, before my triad partners come up here. Uh, this year, we know the Unified Command Plan move responsibility for global missile defense operation support from underneath U.S. Strategic Command and tuck that up underneath U.S. Space Command for a couple of reasons. One is U.S. Space Command has responsibility as a global sensor manager. Our missile defense sensors, which do a great job with in the missile defense mission, can also do space domain awareness. So instead of having this STRATCOM, SPACECOM, never any tension between the two COCOMs, but we also didn't have really, you know, true unity of effort, unity of command. So being able to take my command and my responsibility and taking the missile defense responsibility, moving it under the U.S. Space Command, and now calling it trans-regional missile defense has really aligned it a, a lot better for myself and for the, for the command. With trans-regional missile defense, we are exploring a concept which we've, we've rehearsed it, we've done it in a couple of exercises with Space Command called the Missile Defeat Effects Coordinator. So you might ask, well, what the heck is missile defeat? So I want you to think about traditional integrated air missile defense that we all know about. It's active defense with PAC-3 and THAAD and Aegis BMD, some attack ops, some passive defense, all part of what we normally would describe as integrated air missile defense. But in the last couple of years, we've started talking about left of launch, right? Our ability, our desire to disrupt, de delay, deceive, disintegrate adversary missile capability left of launch. So whether that's in the silo, still on the tell, on the runway, somewhere before that missile, that aircraft has taken off. All together, so left of launch, integrated air missile defense, all together becomes missile defeat. And what we've experimented with in the concept is a missile defeat effects coordinator where we've given that responsibility to the U.S. Spacecom commander with my JIFIC IMD hat on being the heavy lifter for, for General Dickinson to be able to assume that role. Well, you can imagine now with the triad that, that we have the capability and the capacity to really get after the left of launch capabilities. And when you look at FM 3.0 and you look at some of the statements in, in FM 3.0, and I, I jot them, I don't have a great memory, so I just wanted to jot them down. But FM 3.0 says, we have to be able to provide the commander with options to defeat, destroy, disrupt, deny, or manipulate enemy networks, information, and decision making. Boy, if that doesn't sound like something that the triad is postured to do, and General Braga and General Barrett will talk about some things that we've done. If posture to do to get after and support missile defeat effects, I mean, it's tailor-made for us in FM 3.0. It talks about, FM 3.0, it talks about the strategic deep areas where range of movement for conventional ground forces or policy prohibits those operations. So employ triad, so this is where we can employ triad capabilities because conventional forces might not be able to get after those deep areas. And you think about where the adversary puts their missile capabilities at, again, left of launch, our ability to uh, affect, those, uh, affect those missile operations. And then the last one in FN3.0 talks about counter adversary efforts to limit or prevent US access, forward positioning of layered integrated air defense, early warning radars, rocket artillery, electronic warfare capability, and counter space capability. Again, this is just right out of 3.0. So being able to take what we've done in the triad here in the last couple of years now, and as we continue to mature it, we exercise the heck out of it. We do it in, we, we've used the triad in operations right in line with FM 3.0. And what I will wrap up with 
is the triad is really no, nothing more complicated than just combined arms, but using our capabilities and our accesses and our ability to do things during uh, really, uh, you know, pre-crisis operations as we're looking at active campaigning, being able to provide those capabilities and do those early on. And again, FM 3.0 talks about using capabilities that aren't so overt as to escalate into conflict but instead be able to operate in the crisis, in crisis without, uh, without further escalation. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, General Barrett and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Dan. This is, this is made for feedback right here, two microphones together. Um, good morning, everyone. So it's been a year since we last saw you. Some of you are new to this crowd, um, to this particular Warriors Corner. Some are, are folks who have been here before and asked really hard questions. Um, I, I want to echo off some of the things that General Carbler said. This piece about delivering options for commanders is really important. I think there's a range of things that we think about in the spectrum of conflict from campaigning to crisis to conflict itself. Uh, General Carbler talked about this piece about are there points at which you can you know, de-escalate. And having that range of options with the pe very peculiar capabilities that we have. We're operational, we have some unique technologies that we bring to bear and special skills and from an Army cyber standpoint, where I see co complementing uh, my partners here in the triad is really coming, helping them perhaps with the data engineers and analysts that might be able to take some of what we have and operationalize that for the mission that we're doing. We might also be able to provide the operators forward that can conduct um, cyberspace operations, but now have been aided with the range that these two organizations can give us. Because one of the things that I'm thinking about is not everything can be an on-net operation. We should anticipate be operating in a contested environment. And what does a disconnected cyberspace operation look like that these types of things that we've been experimenting with, I know last year we said we're participating in a lot of exercises and we're doing some experimentation. That experimentation for those types of scenarios now will continue to tweak, but we actually can turn them out into actual capabilities for warfighters for their use, and I know Joan Braga will talk about that. So three exercises last year, three will be completed this year, full slate of exercises for next year to take the, the capabilities that we have. Again, whether it's the data analytics, whether it's the cyberspace on net or off net operator, whether it's a capability developer that might be forward and can, can tweak something on the fly for the operation. Those are the types of scenarios that I think we're we are preparing for in order to generate those options um, for the land force commander or the joint commander. All right, good to see everybody again here on the floor. Uh, some familiar faces and some new faces here, but uh, if it's the first time hearing about the, the triad, thanks. Thanks for showing up and uh, just hearing us uh, speak a little bit and then answer some of your questions. So. I say, uh, first of all, the events of the last 96 hours, some people would probably be thinking this is a 1973 moment. The tragedy going on in the Middle East and Israel right now, and our thoughts and prayers go out for those who are suffering. But I'd like to say this is a 1939 moment. 1939 moment with the challenge laid out very clearly in NDS with the threat of the People's Republic of China. You know, the slide behind me talks about the backbone of our nuclear deterrence uh, triad there. This triad's a different triad, okay? This one's a modern-day triad. 
I think it's baked in a regular warfare, and all three of our formations contribute to assuring and coercing, in accordance with the Joint Pub, Joint Pub One, to provide asymmetric, non-attributable options, flexible deterrent, flexible response options for the Joint Force. That's what we're trying to do as we experiment here going forward. Okay, we're, we're, whether it's a cyber network, a space network, a missile network, a terrorist network, an army network, it all provides opportunities for every one of these three different organizations to provide those options for the joint force to add to that deterrence. And it hasn't just been, I'm going to talk about what we've been doing the last year and what we're getting ready to do the next year, because we're getting ready to double double the amount of experimentations we did last year. Collectively, we did seven together last year. That's everything from tech exchanges, FTXs, field experimentations. Next year, it's going to be double that and over 14. That's led to identifying gaps, capabilities, equipment, TTPs, tactics, techniques, procedures. We're informing doctrine in our schoolhouse. We're doing educational exchanges out there. This is happening at the tactical to the strategic level. When I say the strategic level, the chief and the secretary talk about the character of war changing. I would also say the nature of deterrence is changing. The tools that the adversary is using are changing. And we need to stay ahead of the adversaries by converging, converging these three disciplines right here for a larger, holistic, asymmetric advantage against our adversaries. And you better believe our adversaries are investing in these type of capabilities. Now. Uh, some of the, I want to highlight some of the things we've done the last year because you're not just, it's not just us sitting around a whiteboard and, and thinking up smart ideas and concepts out there. But we got three mission threads that we actually agree upon in a charter and work collectively on. And 89 different partners, 89 different partners are working on this across the interagency, the joint force. I'll name some of them and hopefully it's like, wow, I didn't know you're working with them. Again, this is not just an army thing. We're working on this to really be a thought leader for the joint force. Okay, by the convergence of these three different capabilities in front of you. So the three different mission threads we worked on the last year. First, multi-domain OPE, operational prep for the environment. Maria talked a little bit about that, but we, we need to build again, how are you gonna see and sense further, okay? And that's part of it of doing the OPE before time of need. And that contributes across that spectrum of conflict. That's competition, that's in time of crisis, and that's time of conflict or large-scale combat operations. The second mission thread, enabling network access. Whether that's cyber, it could be space, it could be missile, it also could be human. All these things we're talking about still come back to the terrestrial layer where the land force component, the special operations component, the cyber and the, and the space and missile defense component have a nexus there. It all has to come back down to the earth and it all has to be tied back to a human. It provides opportunity for us. The third mission thread, defeat enemy networks. So together, we have an outsized impact against the adversary's capabilities when you're talking about their capabilities in soft space and cyber, which is why it's inherent where we have to work together, why we're experimenting together, we're learning together. And again, we're changing areas from the form and function of equipment to how we interoperate downrange. Now, a couple other things I want to highlight that, we, that we've done. Um, these tech exchanges. We, we've been able to experiment over geographical disparate large distances to have a much larger effect there. Now that may make sense if you're just thinking about cyber alone or space missile defense alone. These are big areas. Then combine with the trans-regional footprint of special operations forces. Again, right now, if you don't know anything about USASOC, we're in 80 different countries. trans -region. Every continent, every GCC has a footprint out there that provides an opportunity for the space community, the missile community, and the cyber community. The other thing we're contributing towards is a, a, a triad functional pra uh, praisement. And this is, we're already on version seven of this. And this fits into Army Futures Command and some of the concepts they're working towards. We're working on that collectively to inform and educate the Army concept, warfighting concept for 2030 to 2040. All right, we're flywheeled into Army Futures Command of how this all works together. So it's written in doctrine, so it's not just an idea in the future. Let me give you, I'll close out, just let me give you a taste of how many organizations have participated in the last year uh, in some of these experimentations. And it's only gonna grow because momentum is growing. Let me read this off real quickly. Hard to memorize because it's so big. First, uh, first MDTF, first Space Brigade in the audience, first Special Forces Command in the audience, Fleet Cyber, don't think they're in the audience today, uh, Army uh, Air Force Special Operations Command, uh, Air Land Sea Application Center, 
Army Cyber, 78th, uh, 780th MI, DIA, DIR3, DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, Intel Capabilities Development Integration Director at IBL, Joint Mission Center, Joint Special Operations Command, Joint Warfighter, Warfare Analysis Center, Marine Special Operations Command, Naval Postgraduate School, NASA Security Agency, Space and Missile Defense Command, Space and Missile Defense Command Center of Excellence, STRATCOM, SPACECOM, SOCOM, USASOC, Special Warfare Center and School. This is just to name a few, and this community is growing. Our international partners are growing as well. I won't call them out here, but there's interest on this, and I think it's going to take all of us, going back to how I open up, to, to address the, the NDS threats, because the scale, scope, and size of those threats are too big for us to individually take on alone. But for an asymmetric advantage, you can leverage this triad right here to contribute towards regular warfare options to provide FDO, flexible deterrent, and flexible response options for the joint warfighter. So look forward to your questions. Thanks for coming back if you're a repeat offender this year. If you're first time showing up, look forward to your questions in the discussion. Thanks for coming. Let me get away from this uh, speaker here. Um, Mark Pomerlo with Defense Scoop. Um, can you just describe what exercising this looks like and how you plan to double this next year? And is this still kind of an informal relationship? How do you kind of present this as a force package to a four-star commander? I call this structured collaboration. It is structured because we do plan what it is that we're going to be doing uh, in advance and, um, and what types of innovation we want to do. So. Uh, there's a charter between us, we rotate it, and then we are working with the respective theaters in terms of the activities that we're going to be doing. And I think you probably want to highlight yeah. some of the other. Yeah, sure. Great question. So this year, moving out, we're actually going to have a triad task force, uh, experimentation task force, where it's a little bit more formal. It's all on the charter. We work together. We come together for all these experiments and exercises. Last year, we deployed a two-star Special Operations Joint Task Force contingency to support the Indo-Pacific PAC Sentry exercise, of which all of our elements played in that in supporting the Joint, uh, joint Task Force, supported Joint Task Force and the Indo-PACOM commander. Uh, that was the first time at a two-star level where we fit into a larger GCC exercise. We're fully embedded in the annual project convergence. A lot of great lessons learned last year, both with our international partners that contributed towards this, uh, that actually provided some... Uh, uh, unique lessons learned as we integrated them into our, the Army Project Convergence run by Army Futures Command. Um, I'd also say, just internally to our most recent uh, soft only rotation at the National Training Center, we were able to embed at the battalion level elements of 1st Space Brigade in, in, as well as uh, electronic warfare, uh, cyber, psychological operations at the battalion level for us for the first time at the battalion level at a CTC rotation. That's just two examples of what we've done the last year, and again, there's gonna be double that next year moving out. Some of those are tech exchanges, some of those are joint level exercises, some of those are FTXs, field training exercises, and tabletop exercises. So a myriad of that as the partners grow and the opportunities grow to experiment. Two years ago, if we were doing an exercise and we were doing our mission analysis and running up the exercise, we never would have thought about, hey, how do we organize space, cyber, and soft? Now it's, it's automatic. So mission analysis within my team is, hey, how are we leveraging the triad capabilities as part of, you know, as part of our mission analysis? How do we leverage that? So that is, that is at the forefront now, whereas two years ago we didn't, even, we didn't even think that way necessarily. We might have cobbled it together, but now it's really part of the formal mission analysis. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I'm Colonel Labouche, French liaison to HQDA. Uh, very interesting. Uh, topic, I think. Could you elaborate a little bit more on why a regular or conventional army is not present in the triads? Because from a French perspective, uh, large units from the regular army, from regular navy, have a role to play when it comes to messaging. Uh, just take as an example the large-scale global exercise uh, to which France sometimes takes part. It does play a message in terms of deterrence regarding some near-peer uh, adversaries. So why the Army or the Navy, Air Force, are not part of the triad? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think everyone is responsible for messaging. I, I, I'm 
card-carrying believer in uh, information operations and psychological operations as the proponent for psychological operations. I think it's critical in everything we do. I, I, th I think it's perhaps the most, uh, uh, in, could be the most important lesson learned from the, uh, you know, the, the crisis in Ukraine. I mean, the world has rallied to support the Ukrainian armed forces, in my belief, because of information operations and uh, garnering support. I think the resistance and resilience capability of the Ukrainian people is there because of successful information operations. Uh, you know, there's, there's tragedies all around the world that the world doesn't necessarily pay as much attention to, uh, but I think information ops is key, and I think every organization across the joint force should have informational advantage and information operations capability. What we provide is a little bit, uh, uh, is in support of the joint force. It's, it's not in competition. We're very intertwined with the MDTFs, the multi-domain task force. Uh, we're kind of leading, uh, kind of like I would say, one of the thought leaders in the Army's journey on in information advantage. So it's not just how you can influence, going back to the definition of the irregular warfare, assure and coerce. But we, we lay our stake, and we, as far as SOF, Special Operations Forces, we're born and bred to do a regular warfare. That is different, I and mean, we're all a little bit different. There's nothing else like us in the Army, so we are responsible for our own uh, doctrine, our own capabilities development, which is a little bit different than the operational force down there. So it's, it's kind of our charge to lead the Army and lead the Joint Force in our requisite expertise there. So this is not, uh, they're not part of it. We see us supporting the Joint Force in a larger, I would say modern day deterrence triad out there. That is, uh, that's just my take on that. And I talked earlier about, uh, you know, we've, we've we exercised this, we practiced the Missile Defeat Effects Coordinator uh, with the SpaceCom uh, a few months ago. And again, not operating in a vacuum, not operating in our own little triad cell, but integrated with the joint fires element, integrated with the intel folks, integrated with, with all targeting elements to make sure that as we're supporting that geographic and combat command and what his or her scheme of fires is, that what capabilities we're able to bring early on are fully integrated into that planning effort. Michael Kuiper, private industry and cyber, uh, working mainly in Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus. What is a good venue for private industry to bring some of the lessons that we've learned into this triad and, and help with the efforts and bring our expertise in? Yeah, I, so when we're talking about cyber capabilities, um, coming on down to the, the CFIC, uh, down in Augusta at the Georgia Cyber Center, that we have, that's generally when we're talking about cyber capabilities where we're taking, um, uh, you know, we're either expressing what our requirements are uh, or we are receiving something from you uh, and seeing whether there's an operational application for it. Uh, I think you probably each one of us have a similar, um, you know, doorfront to come into to do that. And then when we are get our teams are getting together and taking doing that mission analysis, that's where we would probably combine our unique, you know, we we would take the things that you maybe you brought to us in Augusta, and then say, hey, John, could you use this? Because uh, we think we've got a vendor who has that that might be able to be complement the operation. Over. Yeah, we we each have a, a I would say as a single point of contact there for United States Army Special Operations Command. Uh, that's our, our UFMC, USASOC Force Modernization Center, which addresses a lot of our gaps out there. And we make those available to industry, um, as well as our DCG for modernization. Scott Wilkinson, who I think is in the crowd here, as well as one each, Colonel Luke Van Antwerp. So uh, that, that's our single point, and, and welcome to have a conversation afterwards if you have something specific. Uh, like, but we, we, bottom line is we need this floor right here, part of the solution. This is not going to be an Army solution, and, and this is not going to be a Joint Force solution. What's required is a whole of nation so solution, and I would argue a whole of international community solution to address the, uh, uh, the scale, scope, and size of the threat. So we look forward to the conversation. 
Hi, thanks. Patrick Tucker from Defense One. Sort of, sort of building on that a little bit. As part of this collaboration, all the exercising that you're doing, have you begun to identify specific needs that are unique to this group that aren't uh, maybe expressed in a SOCOM budget or the Army budget or Space Command budget? Uh, what are those or what do you anticipate those needs being? Thanks. I'd say if we went back three years ago, we had individual needs, and now the collective has even added to the emphasis. Like the need for moving data securely is critical to both our formations for, for Dan and, and special operations. And when we look at being part of the sensor to shooter network in the deep and strategic deep fires area, uh, it's critical that I have some sort of capability to tie into Maria's aspect of her, her role. Um, of protecting that data, moving that data, making sense of that data. Uh, so before, my, my needs might not have registered as high, but when it's all three of us talking, of like how am I going to get part of a, perhaps a data solution to the, to the missile side of the house, and I got to work with Maria to get there before, I might not even register that on the SOCOM side of like, well, that's interesting. But now when all three of us are talking, we have a collective need here, it raises the floor level of the importance of it. I think that's part of this right here, even having a, a warrior's corner, if that makes sense. And I would add to Intel, right? So the, the, the vectors that we go after on the Intel side now have got to be much more integrated instead of me just looking at a, a missile vector or a cyber vector. Now it's how does Intel integrate the, the Intel enterprise to be able to get, at, get, get after the multi-domain or multi-capability multi approach that we all bring? Yeah, it, and from my perspective, some of the things that I think we already had programmed in terms of, hey, these are the emerging type of capabilities that we'd like, we've gone back and refined as a result of the experimentation. I think it's a it's now a much better requirement than it was previously. The other thing I just foot stomp is the trans-regional nature of what we look at and separately looking at those trans-regional um, systems is not as, uh, it's more understood now when we're combining the, the lens of each of our expertises from space and missile to cyber to special operations and, and the way we have looked at the world uh, previously, we think that's a unique value proposition to the joint force because we look at the global problem sets with our respective adversaries' capabilities in soft space and cyber. That, that again, that's different than just a couple years ago. We might look at a silo and just, I might just be looking at a soft adversary. It's much different now when we combine that, that look. Joel Schachman from Reuters News. Uh, General Braga, you mentioned the idea of um, unattributed messaging playing a role in, um, in this kind of uh, deterrence triad. Um, I was just hoping you could give some kind of more kind of concrete example of how that might play out so we can kind of conceptualize it. Yeah, sure. When, I, mean, uh, I mean, anyone my age, our age, uh, going back and you took any international relations degree from a community college to Georgetown University, you read shelling, you read deterrence theory. There was a bunch of knowns and knowns, and there was knowns to the game as far as game theory of what nation states would do. I would say with the democratization of, of technology, and you see low level asymmetric options just used in the last 96 hours that were used back in 1973, used again just 96 hours ago, uh, the rules of the game are not under, uh, as well as, they're not as stable. So I think messaging is key to, I would say again, a renaissance and deterrence theory of what is a red line and how do you message that, whether that's 100% on the diplomatic stage, which we support our uh, diplomacy uh, uh, counterparts there, or if it's towards an adversary. Um, messaging's played a, a huge role just in the tactical and operational sense in the Ukraine right there. We've supported our Ukrainian partners uh, there. You've had 17,000 Russians desert. 17,000 Russian desert. That's 17,000 soldiers you'd have to blow up on the battlefield or destroy that has weakened the, uh, you know, the defensive mechanisms of the, of the Russian, uh, Russian defense right now. So I, I believe going back to whether it's tactical, the tactical of eroding will and morale of individual soldiers to eroding the overall capability of a unit, it's, it's inherent and it's a traditional military activity to impose doubt into the minds of the adversary. And I also think it's our responsibility to impose cost and belief in the adversary's mindset. 
at the ultimate, warfare is about a contest of wills. You, know, you can have an annihilation strategy, I'm just going to destroy every red icon on the map. At the end of the day, you have to convince a human to stop doing what they're doing. That comes back to influence and psychological operations, which I think is critical to warfare and always has been part of warfare. So you're the content guy, <laughs> yeah. right? And so what I'm going to tell him is, where is it coming from? How is it coming? How is it being delivered? Who is doing it? Is it automated? Should it be, tar you know, can we target it depending on what the operation is and what kind of effect we're trying to have? And so this is at the layer. It becomes ones and zeros at some point, and, and we can give you that feedback in terms of to shape what it is that you're doing. And this is why this comes to get, this threesome comes together really well. Not only is he the content guy, he's the access guy too. So first Space Brigade soldiers, when they're operating with their soft counterparts, are gaining access that a first Space Brigade soldier normally wouldn't have. But together, they're getting into areas that, that are advantageous to us and disadvantageous to the adversary. John Dodson, uh, Thayer Energy, Inc., West Point. <laughs> I, uh, I was in Special Forces long, many years ago, and one of the problems we had, which what you've just described could actually exacerbate, is the problem of making decisions at the edge, getting the intelligence back up, getting it digested and sent back down. And we, we really just didn't trust the straight leg people anymore, So because there were so many holes in the, the normal chain of command that we refuse to share a lot of intelligence. What have you done to do things like you to store where you can depict the battlefield immediately and react to it? Well, I'll start. So it goes back to the access. So my space operators are able to do exquisite operational preparation of the environment on adversary capabilities. But we couldn't do that if we didn't necessarily have the access that, that software cyber are gaining us. And we're able to take that operational preparation environment, take that information and data, get it across a pretty robust federated intel community with great support from U.S. Space Command, Space and Missile Defense Command, SOCOM, you name the intel entities that are out there to better refine the intel product that, if needed, during crisis operations, we can put into effect, but we're taking advantage of what we're able to do in the competition phase. Yeah. I, I We've done it already. Yeah. So we've taken an operational environment, taken the capabilities that we have, um, and been able to show, show that layer from the space, from the electronic emissions standpoint, from the messaging standpoint, from the activities. Uh, so we have done that successfully and brought that together. And, and the other thing too is, again, we all three of us have exquisite access to the intelligence and, and so we can talk to each other, which is a little bit different when we're going down to the edge and to that, you know, battalion commander doesn't always necessarily, and we can, pro I would foresee that we'd be able to project that back, you know, giving our unique capabilities, unique accesses, be able to project that back in the appropriate operational scenario. Yeah, a lot to unpack on that one. That's a great question. The uh, I would just, I would add a little bit of context. At the end of the day, uh, big believer in AI, big believer in, in making sense of the senseless, the ever increasing amount of data that's out there. But at the end of the day, humans are going to be intellectually curious and go places perhaps that we're not there yet on AI and ML or data or even high-end Intel. A lot is available just in open source. Um, and I think that's an, it's still an underdeveloped and under-resourced under, under, uh, area there of how much treasure trove information, especially as the world gets more and more connected, it's not all going to be exquisite intel. Humans on the ground are going to be part of that solution. You're seeing that unfold behind the lines in Ukraine right now. It is not all because of eyes in the sky. And that's, uh, that's unique. And uh, if you probably ask someone two or three years ago, they'd say, you're crazy, you're not going to be doing anything behind enemy lines, you know, humans, you know, everything's going to be just from ISR in the sky. And that, that's not unfolding, uh, I think, right now in uh, any of the crises around the world. We're, we're getting a lot of stop signs here. We'd love to go a couple more hours. Uh, but 
Really appreciate the questions. Just appreciate your time being here to hear from all three of us. Uh, I'll pass the mic, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the next presentation in Warriors Corner will begin at 9.50.